somehow we have online open labs. So we do have that. I don't know what Jody has in plan, but I will set those times up online to so to hopefully you guys have a little bit of time to get at least settled into doing this material. Now, obviously everything's gonna be online, even lab practicals. You guys have probably heard like some colleges have moved their summer school online. So I know Madison has, and some other colleges have already started moving their summer school online as well. It's kind of crazy. Kind of crazy how fast it's moved. So once we look at this anatomy and physiology revealed, the good thing about this is that you can quiz yourself, right? So they are it's just hard to get to. So you go to the My Course Content right here, click, and then select the module, which is, let's say we're doing the respiratory, click, and then you can start doing, right, my dissection or take quiz. So once you take a quiz, you can kind of go look at the material. What is this, right? So you think it's, you know, the thyroid cartilage, right? Or the laryngeal prominence, right? So that's how you can kind of, you know, go to the next one. What is this? Well, we know it's a concha, right? So these are all things we can do to quiz, e quiz each other as we go through the material online and in anatomy and physiology reveal, right? So the good thing about it is, we, you know, we'll go through some of this. You can see the epiglottis, the vocal cords, all of that is there. Um, they have a lot of terms that we don't. So there's like 130 some questions only in the respiratory. So there are a lot of terms that they use that we don't. So just a little warning on that part. Oh, okay, so how have you guys been? Most of you guys. Let's I've been see. okay. Yeah, are you guys getting kind of bored? <laughs> kind of bored at all? Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of oh, definitely. <laughs> Stephen, how have you been, buddy? I'm good. Just, uh, I don't know. I'm just trying to get used to this. Yeah, I know. We're trying to find different things. I guess there's some uh, instructors here that haven't done anything. Like, they haven't posted anything online. I mean, I'm still getting, you know, emails from other teachers that are uh, asking, you know, to link to my stuff. So... I'm like, guys, you know, it's been two weeks, right? <laughs> we should have already at least had like a couple lectures on here, but some of them haven't even posted anything online at all. So I'm kind of worried about how those instructors are gonna do and their students are gonna do once they start summer classes. Um, <clears throat> let's take a look right here. I'm just gonna go through a couple things in terms of the respiratory system. We'll look at the upper respiratory tract. And right here, you'll notice you can see the bony part of the nasal septum. So you can see this up here. Let me see if I can go full screen. That's not it. <laughs> so what we're going to see here is, right, here is the cribriform plate. And you can kind of see a line right here. <clears throat> it looks like an imaginary line. It is there though. Over here, you can see the start or the vomer right here. And then in the anterior portion of the nose, you can see the septal cartilage. You can see uvula. You can see a real nice, real nice uh, opening to the uh, gustation tube. So you can see most of what we've talked about, the hard thing to find is actually the tongue material. So in the tongue with the genial glosses, it's not as clearly defined as what we saw in the models. So in terms of models or uh, video or lecture or like APR cadaver pictures, I would use this thing about the, this picture for the tongue to show genial glosses, genial hyoid, mylohyoid, just isn't very good. So be, you know, kind of go through that material as you uh, go watch some of those videos online. You can really see a nice epiglottis and see how it covers the entirety of the trachea and the larynx right here. It's kind of cool to actually see that. And most people think the epiglottis is way down here. It's actually pretty high up, 
right? It's supposed to be right where the tongue ends and then you push food into the epiglottis. As food gets pushed into the epiglottis, it gets directed to the esophagus. So it's a flap that covers over this entire area right here. You also see over here, the true vocal cords. And then the false is on top, right? The false is more for uh, blocking food matter. Now let's take a look a little bit deeper. Let's see if we can find, you see the conchas, you see the cribriform plate, right? The perpendicular plate was what I was mentioning previously, sorry. And then, yeah, I don't really see much on this one as right now. Now, one thing we haven't talked about, did we talk about the, the teeth at all? If we haven't talked about the teeth, uh, I will kind of discuss that. <clears throat> I do have videos on that. And we'll talk about the liver as well in a second. So the lower respiratory tract right here, Again, pectoralis minor, sternocleidomastoids over here. Then you see the intercostals, internal intercostal. And then external is way out here. Right? You can see the sternum and the ribs coming out. Right now, look at how big the aorta is, right? It's huge. So the, the aorta coming out of the left ventricle, the pulmonary trunk. If you take a look real carefully, you can actually see the ductus arteriosus or the ligamentum arteriosus. Now on this, you can actually, and it's kind of, well, you can see the parietal pleura right here. The visceral would still be stuck on the actual uh, alveolar cells right here. You can see on the right side, superior, inferior kind of margins, right? And then you can see the horizontal fissure. Have a hard time seeing the oblique fissure. It's a little bit more lateral right here. And even on this one, it's hard to see. So we'll take a look if there's a lateral view. If not, then just use the pictures that we have used and the videos that we've made of the models. And I'll see if I can find a picture of the lateral view of this. So here's a horizontal fissure on the right lung. So it separates your superior and your middle lobes. Down here is your inferior lobe. Remember the number of lobes corresponds to the number of secondary bronchi. So you have three secondary, three lobes. On the left side, you have only two. And for some reason, we can't really see a really good oblique fissure on this side as well. Now, what else you notice is, take a look at, there's a, a little bit of a separation between the heart, the cardiovascular, and the lungs, the respiratory. So you do have some kind of connective tissue separating those two areas. As we go a little deeper, then you can see trachea, primary bronchi, and these are secondaries coming off, right? So you can see those, but that's about it. A little bit deeper, you can see the, right, how it just kind of splits apart right there internally. And you can see that bifurcation area right here, All right? Now, let me see if we can find the larynx. The larynx, you can see the hyoid bone right here, thyroid cartilage, the cricoid's real small, but this looks pretty similar to the model that we have used before in class, right? So you can see, and if you know the, the, the actual cartilage and the bone, you should be able to tell which one is which. Meaning you see this thyroid, hyoid, thyrohyoid membrane, thyroid to the hyoid muscle, thyrohyoid muscle, one on each side. Then this is the cricoid. So this is the, from the cricoid to the thyroid, cricothyroid muscle, one on each side. And then you see this tight ligament and it's right down the middle. So this is a median cricothyroid ligament. So let me see if we can take a posterior view to see other 
structures. So these are some of the muscles that, and you can see the trachealis here, right? Some of the constrictor muscles. So let me see if we can go a little bit deeper. Let's so go a little bit deeper. You can see the muscles that allow us to move some of the cartilages, the retinoid cartilages. As you move the retinoid cartilages, you're gonna start moving the vocal cords, tightening and loosening up. So then you can sing with the higher and lower pitches. Now you can see a little bit more clearly some of these muscles that we mentioned. This is your cricoid. It looks very big in the back. So this is coming from the cricoid to the arytenoids. This is your cricoarytenoid muscle. These ones that kind of cross over, that's your transverse arytenoids. And then on this picture, you can see the actual cartilages itself. So these are the arytenoid cartilages. And when the muscles on them, you can just get a general outline of where they are. You can't really see it well, right? So this is the posterior part of the cricoid. And sitting on top of the posterior part of the cricoid are these kind of triangular, large cartilages called the arytenoids. The arytenoids have ends here that connects to the vocal cords. So as the arytenoids move, the vocal cords will move. On top, you see the corniculate cartilages, and you'll have muscles here that can move the retinoids as well. Remember, it's kind of crazy, but we have 10, 10 different intrinsic muscles here that can, skeletal muscles, that can move your vocal cords. That's how we're able to change pitch so quickly. And some people are actually good at doing that. Let's take a look at the digestive system here. And we look at the digestive system. A lot of this we kind of mentioned previously on a lateral view. I don't really see the glands. I want to see the glands a little bit better. All right, so right here, you can see the product gland. Here's a product gland. Here's a product duct. This person has a slightly larger parotid gland. Again, everybody's slightly different. So it's kind of cool. Most of us will just have this area right here. But this person has a little bit of an anomaly there. So here's a parotid duct that connects the glandular secretion into the oral cavity. So this is actually the buccinator. And you can see the gland, the duct, I mean, penetrating through the buccinator entering the oral cavity. Down here, this is your submandibular gland. Very low. If you can look at that, it looks kind of like fatty tissue. It's not, glands can look like that, but it just have that pinkish appearance. As we go even deeper, we can hopefully see the submit. Here's the mandible right here. And now you can see the sub uh, sublingual gland. So here's a sublingual gland. There's only one sublingual gland, and it's found immediately under the tongue. Now I know there is some kind of sometimes some differences between sublingual, sorry, between sublingual and some uh, between sublingual and the gland itself and the sub the sublingual or lingual tonsils, right? So the sublingual gland is directly underneath the tongue, while the lingual tonsils is posterior. So let's see if we can see that. Nope. All right, but these are all the little connections what's to the submandibular gland. If you guys, when you have a chance, go look in the mirror, lift your tongue up, and you should see two openings underneath the tongue. That's these openings to these ducts from your submandibular gland. Right now, if you ever watch you know videos on YouTube, some people get stones here from infections, and it can be you know interesting but quite gross as they kind of move it out. Let's see what else we can see. The teeth. All right, that's not what we want to look at. Yeah. Yeah, the root canal. All right, yeah. so abdominal cavity. So here in the abdominal cavity, we see the 
right? The yeah. gallbladder. Now remember the gallbladder, and we'll talk about it next week. Uh, when we start talking about 24, the gallbladder, large, but this is just very big now because the gallbladder smooth muscle. Smooth muscles relax after death. Because of that, it's gonna look larger than it should. So your gallbladder should not look that big. The gallbladder's main purpose is to store, only store bile. Bile is produced by the liver. So just keep that in mind that there is that kind of difference, right? It stores it, concentrates it, it doesn't produce it. That's why when people have gallstones, they can remove the gallbladder, yet they can still eat somewhat fatty foods. Now we'll talk about what emulsification is later, but just keep in mind that the gallbladder stores the bile, it doesn't produce it. Now if you take a look, you see all this connective tissue connecting the small intestines to the abdominal cavity. So then the small intestines doesn't just move around, right? It's kind of locked into place. This, these are all called the mesenteries. So when you hear mesentery, that's what it refers to. So let's take a look at the liver. Let me see if we can see a better picture of the liver. Right here. So we're gonna go through, look at the liver. So the liver, when you're looking at this, it's hard to tell because you're looking at it. And because you're looking at it, you would think that this is the left lobe and this is the right lobe. In reality, keep in mind that this is the way it's supposed to be in your body. So we're looking at the front side, and it's probably easier to just kind of imagine it this on the right aspect of our, of our abdomen right here. So this is the right lobe. This is the left lobe, right? You have a connection called right, the ligamentum teres right here. And when we look in the back, you can see a little bit more material in the back. Right lobe over here, left lobe over here. Each of the lobes are gonna produce bile. The liver is not incredibly important in terms of digestion. Its biggest role is what happens after you've digested food. All right, so once you've brought it into your body, the liver then does a lot of work. But in terms of how you break down and absorb food, all it does is produce bile. Right? The pancreas is even more important when you're digesting and absorbing. Now the liver becomes important once it's introduced into your bloodstream. So here's the left lobe, here's the right lobe. Here's a small lobe right here that's long. This is called the caudate lobe and it's right next to the inferior vena cava. Caudet, C, right, starts with a C. Cava starts with a C, right next to each other. Now, what else do we see? This area right here, it looks like a rectangle, like a quadrangle. This is the quadrat lobe. So again, right lobe, left lobe, caudet, quadrat. Now, all this area where all of the vessels come in. Here is your right, common hepatic artery. Here is your common bile duct. Here's your inferior vena cava. Right? Actually, this is a hepatic artery and this is the hepatic portal vein. Sorry about that. Here's a hepatic portal vein, hepatic artery, common bile duct. This region where all of those vessels enter the liver Again, all right, that area right there is called the porta hepatis. So think of it as like the hilum. The hilum of the lung is where all the vessels, all of the bronchi enter the lung. This is the same thing, but instead of calling it the hilum, we call it the porta hepatis. So again, the porta hepatis is the region of the liver where all the vessels enter and exit. This is the round ligament right here. We're going to see that the round ligament coming straight down right here is going to be a remnant of something we all had. So we all had an umbilical cord, right? Well, that umbilical cord and the remnant of it is this in the back. All right, let's see what else. The biliary ducts and the stomach. So... <coughs> Let's see, we can see the ducts again, right? We're gonna see a series of ducts right here. So coming from the liver, 
carrying bio so that you can store it to the gallbladder. This is the hepatic portal vein right here. Here's the hepatic artery. So this area right here would be the porta hepatis. Again, that's just a region of the liver where everything enters and exits. There's also the hepatobiliary tree. There is not a single thing about the hepatobiliary tree. It is a combination of all of these vessels as it comes downwards. So with the hepatobiliary tree, it includes the left hepatic artery, the right hepatic artery. The right and the left hepatic arteries they used to form the common hepatic artery. The common hepatic artery brings any bile produced by the liver into the gallbladder by way of this duct. This is called the cystic duct. So that small duct right there, that cystic duct, that is actually when we're doing right, a cholecystectomy or we're removing the gallbladder, we tie up and suture that area, and then we cut it away, right? Why this area, not the common bile duct? Simple, we tied up the common bile duct. Could you release any bile at all from the liver? No. If we tie up the cystic duct, you can't bring it to the gallbladder because there's no more gallbladder, but any new bile can go from the liver into the pancreas, into the small intestines. Perfect. So they can keep eating slightly fatty food. As we open this up, now we can see, here's a pancreas right here, right? This is what we call the major pancreatic duct, right? And you can see this is a common bile duct. If you take a look, take a look at how they fuse together right here. So the common bile duct and the major pancreatic duct fuses together. As you fuse together, they then squirt all the you know, enzymes and bile into the start of a small intestine called the duodenum. So this duodenal area is incredibly important because that's where you receive all of the enzymes here produced by the pancreas. And all those enzymes produced by the pancreas will, all right, they are gonna be huge in terms of digestion and digestion is just a breakdown of food to smaller particles. So without the pancreas, you will not digest your food. Then the food particles cannot be small enough to be absorbed. And that is actually how people die from pancreatic cancer. People die because they are not able to absorb any, new, any food. So you can see people that have pancreatic cancer, they actually want to eat. But when they eat, since there's no enzyme, nothing's broken down because it's not broken down, it just goes right through the small intestine. And as it goes to the small intestine, you don't absorb it. So lots of people actually get really bad diarrhea immediately after they eat because they can't absorb any of the nutrients that they brought in. Again, common bile duct, look how big that is, right? And then the major pancreatic duct right here, and the major pancreatic duct will release a combination of right, enzymes for breakdown and for of proteins, also enzymes to separate fats and enzymes for separation of carbohydrates. So we'll talk more about that next week. This is also called the Wurzung's duct right here. Let's see if we can find anything else. Nope. Here is the celiac trunk. And take a look at the pancreas. The only thing I wish we could have done is kind of dissected the fetal pig so we can see just how delicate the pancreas really is. It really is kind of delicate. Any questions so far, guys? Not then, you know, I just want to just go through some of this material. Um, a lot of it is already online, so I want you guys to just kind of feel comfortable and going online and taking a look at where it was. Again, that was in our cadaver dissection tool right here. And you can just make sure you, you, know, you wanna get accustomed to using that because we will be using a lot of it as we kind of transition over. I'm trying to go to our class website so then we can 
discuss the last part of chapter 23. And then I'll give you guys the answer to that extra credit question as well, right? Again, the extra credit question, all about, let me see, right? Extra credit question, it was all about the, you know, why is there extra, why is the oxygen more as you exhaled out? And I'll talk about that in just a second. Ah. Where is it? Okay, perfect. And again, let's go back here. I'll go down here. Where is that? Sorry guys, right here. So when we take a look at this right here, the question was, why is a PO2 104 in the alveolar cells, but in the expired air, went up to 120? And the reason was simple, right? And I know, you know, I had it due for over the weekend. So I think the, the question is still up, but I do want to answer it before you guys have a chance to kind of uh, take the quick test. The PO2 increases as you expel it, and it's not a mistake. Right? The reason why it's simple is because some of this inspired air never gets it through the alveolus. So if the air right here, as you're breathing in, is 160, that's an amount of oxygen. As it gets into your dead space, your trachea, your bronchi, your bronchi,